Well, thank you, Dan, and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, letting me present today. Um, this presentation was originally developed for the school wood chip and pellet users conference that we hold each winter here in Vermont. Uh, we have a number of schools utilizing wood for energy, uh, heating primarily, and as a result we, we've developed this annual conference that we use to uh, get the word out about new developments and, and uh, to provide some support to those wood energy users. So I wanted to put the, the presentation in context a little bit and give you a little bit of background. Uh, Vermont's first school conversions to wood heating were made back in the mid-1980s. Uh, and at that time, sawmill or wood manufacturer residues were really the fuel source for all those early conversions. Uh, you know, residue chips are uniform, they were readily available, and the small quantities that we were using in, in the school heating program really weren't even noticed by the alternate markets like the paper mills and the power plants. But uh, as the, as the uh, number of schools using wood chips increased and the number of hardwood sawmills in our state has decreased, we, begun, we began to have occasional interruptions in supply. And you know sometimes this was the result of a, the fact that school users really weren't familiar with the sawmill industry or the processes used in uh, chip production. And they, they made mistakes uh, like assuming that ordering wood fuel was just like ordering oil. It just isn't as seamless uh, sometimes as, as working with uh, a fuel like oil or natural gas. Sometimes they just didn't plan ahead for common things that uh, folks in the industry would have, have recognized very easily, like the typical Christmas to New Year mill shutdowns, um, and that led to some, some supply issues at times. Uh, sometimes there were actually log shortages due to weather and other conditions that led to reduced production and, and made mill chips less available. So with with all these things going on, uh, you know, re reliability and the price of wood fuel for the schools became a pretty regular topic of conversation at our annual users meetings. And over the years, I've been asked to address fuel supply issues and trends every year. And, and that's really where this uh, presentation was developed. So what I hope to do this morning is uh, to give you some background with respect to what wood fuel use is, is like in Vermont. Um, look a little bit at uh, wood chip and pellet supply and market trends, uh, as well as looking at some developments that may affect uh, supply and price in the future. Um, and you know, these are primarily focused on Vermont, but uh, certainly apply to northern New England and probably many of them apply to the, the Northeast in general. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a few predictions from my completely unscientific crystal ball. Uh, so just, just so you know, some of the information in the presentation is going to be specific to our circumstances, uh, but much of it's going to be uh, information that can be utilized across the region. Now, Vermont has a pretty well-developed network of wood fuel markets uh, that are distributed around the state. We have two electric generating stations, uh, one in Burlington, one in Rygate on the Connecticut River that uh, amount to about 70 megawatts of capacity. We have 13 plants using steam for industrial heat and processes. Uh, primarily those are in the wood using industry. Um, typically uh, sawmills that are using steam as uh, heating for their dry kilns. We have uh, five facilities using industrial uh, Co or institutional cogeneration, uh, a couple of dry kiln facilities, as well as uh, two of the universities and colleges, uh, Green Mountain College in Pulteney, Vermont, and one that many of you may have heard of, uh, the Middlebury College system, which is also a cogeneration system and doing district heating. Uh, biomass district energy and institutional and commercial heating is probably the the sector that we're best known for here in Vermont, uh, 51 facilities, and that's those are the include the facilities using uh, wood chips and pellets in the schools. 
And then one that we often don't think too much about with respect to wood energy, but is a pretty significant um, factor, at, at least here in Vermont, is residential firewood. We have over 81,000 households burning wood for some uh, amount of their space heating needs. So that's a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant number. To, uh, to focus in a little bit on, on that uh, institutional segment, uh, you know, certainly the public schools are our, our most common or most commonly known piece of our, our wood energy picture here in Vermont. Uh, we do an annual survey as part of our annual users meeting and uh, collect information on school wood chip use, savings, that, that sort of information that we share with the group and have available on uh, the Biomass Energy Resource Center's website. Uh, right now we have 43 schools operating wood chip systems in the state and that amounts to about 35 percent of all the square footage in public K through 12 schools and about 30 percent of the student population. Uh, the dots on the map, the yellow dots uh, indicate the schools that have wood chip systems, the blue dots are indicating schools that are using pellets for, for uh, heating. We have a couple of pellet systems that were operating in 09 and 10, um, a couple more that came online during 2010. We're using about 23,000 green tons of chips annually uh, in the schools. If you look back to 2000, 2001, uh, our total usage in all the schools at that time was less than 8,000 tons. So in the last 10 years, we've had a pretty significant growth in, in this segment. Uh, we don't have a good handle on total usage of pellets at this time, but um, the we know one school which we did receive uh, a survey back from uh, was using about 160 tons. Had one question about efficiency of wood chips versus wood pellets. Um, system efficiency is you know is going to be higher with wood pellets than it would be with wood chips, um, primarily because of the fact that uh, you're using a dry fuel as opposed to a green fuel. And uh, the green, you know, certainly part of the loss in efficiency with a wood chip system burning green chips is uh, boiling off that much water. Uh, in spite of all of the institutional users of wood fuel that we have in the state and all the attention that sector seems to receive, um, all of those users combined only account for about 8% of the total wood fuel that we use annually here in Vermont. Uh, but it is the sector where we've seen the most growth over the, over the last few years. Uh, if you look at uh, the cogeneration sector, we're actually down somewhat from previous years. Uh, primarily due to the closing of one small paper mill in the northeastern part of the state. And uh, utility scale use fluctuates considerably over the, um, over the course of the year uh, and from year to year. And, and that's primarily because the, uh, the McNeil station, the Burlington Electric Station in Burlington, which is a 50 megawatt plant, is dispatched based on power price uh, by the New England Power Pool. So it, how much it runs in any given year is really dependent on the price of, of energy and alternate fuels within the region. And typically, that, that means the price of natural gas. Um, so if natural gas is high, Burlington tends to run more. If gas is lower, it uh, runs less. But uh, you know, one of our, uh, the most surprising statistics here is in Vermont is that the uh, that this graph points out is that more than half of the total wood fuel used in Vermont is estimated to be residential firewood. And I mentioned that 81,000 um, households using wood for space heating in the state, that accounts for about 314,000 cords uh, of wood being used. Uh, had another question here regarding um, any concerns about more chimney cleaning with wood energy systems. Uh, typically these 
systems burn hot enough that uh, they do not really form creosote in the chimneys. We, we haven't ever had any real issues with, uh, with having to clean chimneys with these, these wood chip heating systems, even though they are burning uh, green wood. Um, they're, they're burning at so much higher a temperature than a residential wood heater would that uh, you burn off most of those volatiles. So, so moving right along here, who, so who, who is supplying uh, institutional wood heating systems in Vermont? And uh, we also collect some information about the suppliers that we have. Uh, in the state, we have about 15 p p different companies supplying wood chips to schools. Um, and of those 15, six of them were sawmills, uh, two of them are truckers or brokers who are buying wood from a variety of different sources, uh, acting primarily to perform the logistics piece of the, of the equation. Uh, six bull chip producers, and uh, I should explain uh, bull chips for those folks that may not be familiar. Um, Essentially, a bowl chip is what we're defining as, uh, it, basically it's produced by taking tree-length firewood uh, without any tops or limbs and running it through a whole tree chipper. Um, it's a bark-on chip, it, uh, but when you're, we're using strictly bowl wood or strictly stem wood in the whole tree chippers, they produce a pretty uniform chip. Um, it's a fairly clean chip. It doesn't have a lot of oversized material, and it works really well in these institutional size boilers. Um, so, and what we found is, as as our market here has matured and we've lost more sawmills, uh, these bull chip producers have really taken up the slack and and have really been able to uh, to fill the void and and produce a, a reasonably priced chip. We also have one landscape mulch producer who's uh, in the Albany, New York area, who's supplying schools. The, uh, the blue dots on the map here represent the bulk suppliers of wood pellets. And uh, one thing to note is that we, though we have six different suppliers, uh, only one of, one of those in Vermont that uh, is supplying bulk pellets actually has their own manufacturing facility. The others are all using... Uh, pellets they receive from either New Hampshire or Maine mills. So we've also seen a great deal of growth in the area of bulk pellet suppliers in the, in the last year or two. Uh, I mean, just a few years ago, if you wanted, if you were looking for uh, bulk pellets and you wanted them delivered, you'd either be looking to mills in Canada or New England wood pellet that many of you folks may may recognize the name in uh, Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Um, there really was no other pellet production a few years just a few years ago in uh, in New England. But since that time, with the increase of capacity in the Northeast and the number of bulk users, uh, we really have seen a, a lot of of suppliers stepping forward and uh, providing bulk pellets to that market and it, it uh, you know a few years ago people were really reluctant to put in bulk pellet using systems because of the fact that there just wasn't a supply but uh, as those have been constructed we've certainly seen companies come in and fill the gaps So I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and spend a little time talking about some of the trends we've seen in chip and pellet supply and pricing, uh, as well as some of the potential future market influences. Um, I had another question here uh, regarding concerns about diseases and uh, uh, insect pests perhaps being transferred with wood chips, and I I can uh, I'll I will address that a little later on. I have a slide that, that speaks to that issue. So, Over the last 10 years or so, as the number of institutional wood chip systems has increased, we've seen a real shift in the source of where that fuel comes from. Um, you know, during the 2000-2001 heating season that you see here on, on the uh, graphic, 
the vast majority of chips were, were coming from sawmills. They were residue chips from sawmills. Uh, we had a few little bit of material coming from brokers, um, and the vast majority of that was probably also coming from sawmills. But uh, since then, we've seen a significant shift to bowl chips as a dominant fuel for, for wood chip heating here in Vermont. And as I mentioned earlier, um, really with the reduction in, the, in sawmill production, folks have had to come up to step up to the plate and find a new, a new source of material, and, and bowl chips have really filled in. And you'll, so you'll notice that in 2009-2010 data, uh, we don't show any chips coming from brokers. Well, that's not exactly the case. What, what this is actually doing is showing that um, we were able to obtain from the producers or from the, the uh, brokers uh, some data on where their material was coming from, and we broke it down between sawmills and bowl chips. So where you see a big increase in bowl chips and the reduction in brokered wood um, isn't really representative. It's, it's probably, uh, but the 0910 data is, is a little bit more accurate than, than what we've had in the past. Um, so as you can see, you know, probably better than twice the amount of, of bowl chips to sawmill residues now being utilized for chips. Another interesting trend um, that we've been able to track over the years has been the stability of wood chip pricing over time. You know, the, the data on the, this graph uh, is from our annual survey of wood chip users. Uh, we, we take data on both the prices that they're being they're paying for wood chips as well as the price they're paying for whatever their alternate fuel is. Uh, in the case of most of our systems, uh, fuel oil, number two oil, is the alternate fuel. We have some schools now, a few more schools, utilizing uh, natural gas as their alternate. And so in 2009-2010 uh, is the first year we actually were able to track natural gas prices, but we'll be doing that over time as we go forward. The prices shown here are in dollars per million BTU and they're net figures, so we've already corrected for moisture and system efficiency in these figures, so you're really comparing apples to apples uh, when you're looking at these dollar per million BTU figures. You know, during the 2009-10 the season, schools are paying on an average of $57 a green ton for wood chips, um, and the prices ranged between $42.50 and $71. So a pretty significant range depending on the source of the chips and the transportation distances from the supplier to the schools. So as you can see, wood chip prices have really been really very stable over time. And while they've trended up in recent years as the price of oil has increased, it's been at a much slower rate of increase. Um, Average chip prices dropped a little bit in 2009, 2010. That's primarily due to uh, lower diesel fuel costs and some uh, effective competition. We've got enough suppliers in the system now that schools are able to, to uh, bid out their um, chip contracts and they've been able to drive the price of chips down a little bit as a result. And, Anytime you're dealing with a bulky material like this, transportation costs are a huge factor, and, and that's one of the reasons why diesel fuel is, its prices are so sensitive to diesel fuel. You know, one, one thing that we do like to point out to uh, the users every year is uh, what the equivalent price of oil would be at their current price of chips. When the school sees a price of chips go up five or six dollars a ton, um, it seems to them to be a really significant increase, uh, something they always raise as concerns. But when you bring it back to the equivalency uh, numbers and you let them know that $57 a ton wood chips are equivalent to $1.14 a gallon number two fuel oil, uh, something we haven't seen in quite some time, uh, it kind of brings things into perspective for them. Couple more questions. Um, 
Charlie Becker in Virginia uh, asking what are the cost comparisons between green chip and pellet systems. Uh, chip systems tend to be much more costly. The, uh, the reason behind that is primarily the storage system. Uh, boilers, you know, the boilers aren't that much difference in the price. Most of the uh, systems use a Hearst boiler with, a, with uh, some add-on uh, firebox capacity for, for burning wood. But the chip handling and the chip storage are, are really the two biggest cost factors uh, with a wood chip system. Uh, you know, you, you're I'm, I, afterwards, if folks want to uh, get some ideas of prices, I can, uh, you know, they can email me and I can and try to uh, pull some of that stuff together from some past school conversions. But typically, I can tell you, our, the way our school uh, cost sharing with the state aid goes, um, any system that's being put in has to meet a 30-year life cycle cost analysis. So it, it has to pay out over at least 30 years. And what we've found is a school of less than about 50,000 square feet um, will not pay out over that time period because of the fact, uh, if with a wood chip system, won't pay out over that time period because the cost is uh, of the storage and, and handling is so much more expensive. So for those smaller systems, uh, pellets are a much better choice, um, much easier to handle, much less storage uh, cost associated with them. So it, um, it really depends on the size of the system. Uh, with the pellets, you're paying considerably more uh, per million BTUs than you are for wood chips, um, but you've got a lot more invested into the, the uh, into the infrastructure and in wood chip system. There was also a question here about species requirements for wood pellets. Um, every wood pellet manufacturer seems to have their own formula, so to speak, that they're using, um, and they act a lot like a um, brew ma brewmaster in a brewery. They, uh, the, they have to come, they, they figure out what works best for them, what the, um, what the mix is that will give them the best um, production characteristics, the, the best uh, um, structural characteristics of the pellet so they don't crumble, as well as uh, the, you know, giving them the proper ash contents. Um, if you talk to someone who who puts out, you know, uses uh, or produces 100% uh, softwood pellets, they'll probably tell you the softwood pellets are the best. Somebody who uses hardwood will probably tell you hardwood's the best. Um, but in any case, it, it really depends on the manufacturer. Uh, so a lot of different species can be used, but it, it, it really comes down to which um, what the manufacturer is looking for. As uh, so, it's getting back on track here, as as wood chip markets have matured in Vermont, uh, we've seen a, a really increasing interest in producing chips for schools. Uh, we've got a you know I mentioned we have a number of suppliers. The numbers up a little bit every year, uh, and it's you know they've they've fooling around with schools and. And supplying schools with wood chips um, can be uh, a hassle for a producer. Uh, it really requires a lot of customer service many times. But uh, a lot of our suppliers are, are realizing that it's a nice niche market. Um, it, can be, it can be challenging, but it can be very profitable for them if they're willing to, to go the extra steps. Um, you know, seasonality and overall size of demand are still a challenge for many of the suppliers. But uh, you know, again, it's a it can be a, a good niche market for folks. On a on a broader scale, chip production and demand are affected by the global demand for for lumber and paper. So you know, recently, you know, regionally, we're seeing lumber production at below capacity. 
the housing sector remains weak. You know, we're still having very few new housing starts, and that's really the driving become the driving force between uh, for the lumber industry in North America in, in the last uh, few years. We've lost most of the furniture industry in the United States. Um, many of the other uh, secondary wood manufacturing industries have gone overseas. So housing is is really one of our our main sectors, and and it's been weak. You know, as of last fall, you know, one of the industry associations was reporting that uh, milk production was at about 64 percent of the capacity, and the way markets have been, things haven't changed much over the last uh, six months. Mill production remains down, so residue production remains down, and that, that affects um, both raw material for pellets as well as, uh, as wood chips for, for heating. Paper demand is also down somewhat from historic levels, but it, it has come back somewhat, and, and that oftentimes has to do with the, the strength of the dollar or the weakness of the dollar. Uh, compared to foreign currencies. When uh, the dollar's weak, our paper industry in North America, and has a, or in the U.S. at least, has a tendency to become more competitive. Um, we've also seen some increasing advertising purchases, some, uh, some new tariffs, and as a result, pulp demand and price has been pretty good, and, and that, uh, that also is a competing market for uh, the same raw material that goes into heating systems. In uh, northern New England, firewood demand can be a real driver in, in uh, wood fuel price and availability. And with oil prices uh, lower last year, you know, we saw firewood price and demand drop off somewhat. This year, you know, who, who knows? It really is going to depend on, on what happens with oil prices. If oil continues to drop um, and uh, fuel dealers are willing to lock in oil prices for the coming heating season, we probably won't see much of an increase in demand in firewood. But if oil stays high or jumps again, uh, you know, firewood is, is likely to to push along uh, wood fuel prices in general. Um, it, it really is a, a huge factor here in, in northern New England. Sort of in the good news, bad news category, uh, we did have good logging conditions last winter. Uh, we had sort of an excessive amount of snow, but uh, most of the mills went into the spring with good supplies of logs. We didn't have any mid-year thaws. Um, however, since that time, We've had the wettest spring on record here in, in Vermont. We had, as of yesterday, we had had uh, about 13 inches of rain in just April and May. Um, last night, in, around my house, we got another three or four inches of rain. Uh, as a result, nobody's working in the woods right now. And, and unless we see some really radical change in, in weather patterns, you know, logs and firewood are going to be in short supply going into winter. During the uh, economic crisis, uh, we certainly saw hardwood lumber demand crash. And while demand has improved, many of our local mills have adjusted to doing business with reduced hours or reduced staffing or both. They've kind of adjusted to this new normal. Uh, it doesn't appear that's going to change anytime soon, so lumber and residue productions are unlikely to increase uh, in the near future. And finally, you know, lower log prices are still causing landowners and foresters to uh, delay uh, timber sales in hopes of uh, some of that price rebounding in time. When we uh, look at uh, pellet production trends, you know, uh, production capacity in North America from 2003 to 2008 increased 380%. Uh, and, and if all the proposed plants actually were to come online, we'd see another 150% increase over 2008 levels. There is a lot of capacity out there in the uh, in the pellet world. Uh, you know, we were as of 2008 about 66. The uh, mills were at about 66% of capacity. We've seen pellet prices uh, come down from historic highs. They've been holding pretty steady. 
Uh, and unless we see a real significant increase in demand, we're, we're probably, um, there's plenty of room there within capacity to, uh, uh, for mills to, to be able to meet production goals without raising prices significantly. You know, roughly 20% of our production is exported to Europe, and that that does that demand does have a pretty significant impact on uh, on pellet demand and price. And the other thing you, to uh, remember is that any new capacity is is really going to have to be looking toward raw material from the forest as opposed to uh, inexpensive wood residues. Um, what we've seen around here, any of the new mills coming online are all planning on uh, purchasing round wood and grinding it on site uh, to produce pellets. Um, it's not something they're going to be able to find sawdust or, or wood chips to be able to uh, fuel their production with. Uh, to get an idea of what retail prices were like in pellets last winter, I did a quick Google search here. Uh, looking up pellet prices and I came up with woodpelletprice.com. Now these are advertised prices posted by the advertiser. Uh, sometimes they're not very frequently updated but it can give you a snapshot of retail pricing and what I found last winter was prices ranging between $220, $290 a ton. Uh, I looked just the other day prices are, are very similar. Uh, some have gone up a touch, some have gone down a touch, but overall they're they're roughly the same. Uh, so stable prices from last year. I did do some calling around last winter to find out about bulk pricing. Called the uh, the folks that we had on our list that had been supplying schools, and uh, at that time they were getting about $195 a ton. Uh, plus delivery charges. So depending on where the the schools were, uh, that affected their their actual cost. So what do we see as potential or in some cases unlikely market influences going forward? Well, uh, many of you probably are familiar with the biomass crop assistance program. That did have a, a positive effect on some of our our wood users here last winter. In Vermont, um, or not this last winter, in, in the previous winter, um, the program had been suspended the, during this last heating season. But uh, and we had a number of qualifying facilities that were schools, and and they were able to uh, to negotiate better prices for their their material as a as a result. But um, what we found last October was the program final rules were issued with some real major changes. Uh, the bottom line is it doesn't look like schools uh, and bowl chips are really going to be eligible under the program and really Farm Services Agency hasn't even received the guidance they need to implement the, uh, the portion of the program that, that might affect uh, uh, the qualifying facilities again. So it's uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a player going forward. Uh, here in Vermont and uh, in Maine, interstate weight limits have been quite a hot issue for a number of years now. And it, that's particularly since New York and New Hampshire have higher limits than generally apply uh, by federal rules. Uh, both Vermont and, and Maine had weight limits raised uh, to limits comparable with the limits we have for state highways for about a one-year trial period and that expired last December. Part of that uh, one-year trial period was to collect data on, on uh, costs, uh, both positives from the industry as well as increased maintenance costs from our uh, transportation agencies. Um, and everything came out pretty positive, but um, as you probably are aware, of late it's been very difficult to get anything through Congress, and uh, and our senators have been working at it, but uh, haven't at this point been able to uh, either get those limits in in the Northeast raised permanently, or um, as, or extend the trial period. Uh, if the limits are eventually raised. 
uh, and it may be a situation that occurs nationwide as well. Uh, there's some movement uh, among some of uh, some folks in Congress to try to make that happen. Trucking costs for wood fuels certainly are would be reduced significantly, um, and and we certainly saw that uh, both in in reduced time travel time for trailers delivering to schools as well as uh, reduced cost of fuel. New, new wood fuel users may or may not have a strong effect on markets uh, depending on the type of facility, you know, the size and its location. Now, as an example, this system uh, is currently under construction at the uh, Veterans Administration Hospital in White River Junction, Vermont. They won't have enough demand to really put any uh, constraints on current supplies, and it actually may have a pretty positive effect on uh, on supplies and, and suppliers in the region, um, because the system, unlike a lot of our heating installations that only run five or six months out of the year, um, the VA hospital is going to be doing. Uh, as a steam system and they're going to be doing heating, cooling, and cogeneration. So they're going to have a year a year round load and in some cases we've seen with these kind of installations that uh, the summer load is actually higher than the winter load and uh, as a result there it, it sort of evens out the the supply uh, issues for potential suppliers over time. It gives them a market for chips over the course of the summer that, that they wouldn't have with a uh, typical wood heating system. Giving them more consistency, um, you know, a little better markets to, to deal with. Uh, effects of large facilities are a bit more complicated. Uh, right now we have three biomass power plants that have been proposed in the state. Uh, two of them by Beaverwood Energy. A uh, third system in Springfield, Vermont, that would incorporate a small district heating system. The, uh, the two Beaverwood facilities would have pellet mills associated with them that would, would utilize some of the waste heat from the power plants. You know, large plants can, are definitely going to change the dynamic within their per particular procurement zone. Um, they're likely to stimulate an expansion of whole tree harvesting and chipping capacity which can be a good thing for, for other users, uh, can provide some more potential suppliers for them, uh, but it can also have a, a potentially negative impact on supply, uh, certainly constraining supplies, at least until the production capacity adjusts to, um, to catch up. Energy policy is also going to have an effect on the markets going forward, and, and we're seeing this uh, throughout the, the Northeast and throughout the United States, really. A um, you know, number of states have developed uh, biomass harvesting, BMPs, or regulations. Uh, in Vermont, <laughs> pardon me, I'm doing this from home and my dog just got woke up by something. Um, in Vermont, we have a, a biomass uh, energy development study committee. It's uh, now just entering its third year. Uh, it's a three-year charge to, to look at enhancing the growth of the biomass industry while protecting forest health. And, and they're looking at things like harvesting guidelines that would uh, apply across the board to all harvesting operations because what we're recognizing here and in, in certainly in northern New England is that a lot of our harvesting or most of our harvesting that includes biomass is integrated with other other products and it's really hard to draw the line as to what's biomass harvesting and what isn't um, so we're looking at you know some broad voluntary harvesting guidelines at this time by the end of this process those may be recommended to be mandatory and uh, the committee is certainly looking at procurement guidelines uh, going forward. The, um, the question had been asked earlier about exotic pests. Um, you know, exotic pests are going to be an uh, going to be an issue. Uh, we're surrounded really by a number of different pests. We have Asian longhorn beetle in Massachusetts, 
emerald ash borer has been found uh, just 60 or 100 miles away near Albany, New York. Um, it's also 30 or 40 miles away to our north in Montreal. Uh, it's going to affect the movement of wood, uh, potentially at least between states and counties. Um, you know, probably a lot of you know better than I do about what those effects really are. Um, if you're located in a state that already has emerald ash borer, I can tell you that. Uh, Chipping is generally considered to be a treatment for uh, for some of these pests, but it really is pest dependent. Uh, as long as uh, you get the chips small enough, uh, it can be used to uh, as a treatment. And in the case of New York State, they are uh, chipping uh, air, chipping trees in their emerald ash borer infested zones. Uh, they what they're finding though is uh, Running them once through a chipper isn't enough to, to reach the target sizes of chips they're looking for. Get small enough so they get the the um, the right kill rates. And um, so what they're doing is chipping wood and then regrinding it to uh, to make sure that they have the material small enough to kill the pests. But it it is going to be an issue certainly going forward. So. Um, I'll just uh, wrap up with my completely unscientific predictions, and then uh, I'll, I'll address the questions that have been coming in. Um, so, you know, overall, I think we're going to see chip demand remain relatively stable, at least for a few years here in, in northern New England. Um, we're certainly going to see new small facilities come online. But as, you, as we've shown, those typically don't have a huge effect on supply. Um, larger facilities like uh, power plants are, are going to require a number of years for permitting and construction. So we may see some of those come on board, but it'll be, uh, it'll be some time yet. Sawmill residues in our area are going to continue to be in short supply. Uh, what are being produced are, are really in, in uh, quite strong demand for animal bedding and, and other uses that are higher value than fuel, uh, particularly for sawdust. BCAP, probably not going to be a player going forward. Um, you know, our chip suppliers are probably going to remain relatively stable uh, until we start seeing, you know, more facilities come online. Uh, we have enough capacity, I think, so that um, we're not going to see a lot of new development, but uh, I think we will see overall fuel quality improving. More people will probably be uh, screening chips, pr producing a chip that's more uniform, cleaner. Uh, part of that to meet the demands of their customers. Part of it to uh, meet demands, potentially demands from uh, air quality regulators. And we're going to continue to see diesel fuel and competition uh, uh, influence wood fuel prices. From a pellet standpoint, you know, global demand is really going to uh, continue to be driven by non-market forces. In Europe, it's uh, renewable obligation certificates. The um, essentially their requirements by their um, by the governments in Europe to require their power production to become more renewable, to become greener, and as a result, um, they're using a you know, large percentage of the wood pellets that are being developed, uh, being shipped overseas, or being used in power plants. Um, you know, we're going to continue to see bulk pellet use increase in the United States, in the Northeast. Um, we, in Vermont, we may not see as many new installations coming online very quickly, uh, you know, pellet prices aren't that much different than oil. There's not a huge difference in, uh, there's not a huge savings when you put in a pellet system. But, uh, so as a result, you know, incentives are maybe necessary and certainly for our institutional users with the economy the way it is, those incentives aren't, aren't currently available. You know, bulk availability we'll continue to see. Um, and as oil prices, it, if they remain high, 
you know, pellet supplies are likely to tighten. You know, we may see some increase in, in pricing. I'll, uh, I'll leave these, uh, some of these additional resources up for you for a couple minutes while I'm, I'm talking about, uh, or while I'm answering some of the questions. Um, a couple of things to point out, the uh, annual wood chip and pellet user conference proceedings, uh, you know, the summaries and presentations are available on the Biomass Energy Center's website. Um, and the Biomass Energy Resource Center has also been producing a series of videos. The first one in that, in that series is wood fuel supply chain. Uh, it's kind of a nice little video, runs 10 or 15 minutes on YouTube. Um, good, good information for a general audience if, if folks are interested and want to learn more about wood fuel supply, uh, it's a good place to point them. And with that, I'll uh, wrap up and, and answer some questions here. Um, any concerns about using corn pellets compared to wood pellets? Um, with the price of corn in our area, uh, we haven't seen anybody really utilizing corn to, to any extent. Um, what, I, what I do know, which is, is completely um, you know, hearsay, I guess, uh, from experience my uh, next door neighbor has who has a pellet stove and has burned both corn and wood. Uh, what he found was he, he got more clinkers when he burned uh, corn. The sugars tend to form into uh, kind of a hard substance that, that builds up in, the, uh, in his pellet stove. I don't know if you'd see that same thing on a, on a larger uh, pellet flared boiler or not. Um, certainly here it, it hasn't been cost effective to look at corn as an alternative. Uh, any concerns about using switchgrass pellets compared to wood pellets? Uh, again, kind of anecdotally, the only thing I know about uh, switchgrass, it's, it's being experimented with. Um, folks are looking at it. They're doing some testing now on uh, emissions characteristics of of grass pellets as opposed to, to wood pellets. Um, there is a lot more ash with a grass pellet than there is with, with wood. Um, it has a much higher silica content, you, so you tend to get a lot more ash when you're, uh, when you're burning grass. Uh, have you had the same issues that we keep hearing about in Massachusetts on using wood for energy? Interesting you should ask that, Charlie. Um, as a matter of fact, the, uh, some of the folks that were very active in Massachusetts with respect to um, uh, opposing wood, wood electric production, let me confine it to wood uh, electric production or electric, you know, producing electricity from wood. Um, some of the folks that were real active in Massachusetts have kind of translocated into Vermont and primarily uh, with the, I mentioned the, the, two, uh, the two generating stations that, the, that Beaverwood Energy was uh, proposing. Um, they have essentially been able to, to get Beaverwood to withdraw their proposal for the plant in Townell, which is right on the Massachusetts border. It's the town bordering Massachusetts on our, uh, in our southwestern corner. Uh, so those folks have been active in Vermont. Uh, they've had less success in, uh, in, with the Fairhaven proposal. Um, folks there have, have not been, uh, I guess the local folks there have not been as uh, interested in the, in the message that the, uh, the opponents from Massachusetts have been providing. Uh, with respect to heating systems and smaller units, uh, those, those folks that are opposed to biomass electric don't seem to be as opposed to uh, heating or cogeneration systems. Um, they're inciting primarily what they seem to, to cite is the efficiency improvements when you're doing either cogeneration or heating as opposed to electric production. Uh, is chip quality control becoming a bigger concern or is it uh, less of an issue? Well, I think uh, 
Dan, that goes two ways. Um, I think with respect to the to the um, the ability of the systems and you know typically when you get to the size of a an electric generating station, uh, they remanufacture most of the wood fuel that they receive anyway. They typically have hammer mills in place and will regrind material so that they get a real consistent fuel anyway. Where consistency and fuel quality has been a concern is typically been with the institutional size systems, the smaller systems. Um, they tend to have uh, more trouble handling with fuel handling when you have inconsistent fuel. I think the um, the manufacturers have done a great job of, of making their systems more flexible with respect to being able to uh, handle a, a less consistently sized chip. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the users re really like a, a very consistent chip, uh, a very clean chip, and there, there has been a considerable amount of demand for uh, screened wood chips and and uh, we have two of our bull chip producers now that are actually screening their chips so they're utilizing um, a whole tree chipper chipping bull wood and then running those chips through a screen which removes the oversize as well as the fines uh, and typically what we found is when you're when you're using a whole tree chipper to chip that material, the fines are primarily bark. Um, the bark seems to shatter, become much smaller pieces, uh, so you're losing that in, when you're removing the fines. That's also where most of the dirt is. So in screening, um, we're, we've been able to produce a much cleaner chip, uh, much more consistent chip, and one that the, um, the customers are really demanding. Um, do you anticipate problems with wood chip supply if the housing market booms? Uh, I don't. Uh, I would. I would say if we, um, you know, if there was a boom in housing and we saw considerably more saw logs being manufactured into uh, lumber, we probably would see more residues as a result of that fact, and uh, we probably would actually see more material coming on the market. Uh, one of the things that uh, is pretty constant in, in the Northeast anyway is that our biomass, you know, so-called biomass harvests are very often integrated. They're almost always, uh, if somebody is producing whole tree chips, they're also producing saw logs, pulpwood, and other products. And that's primarily because whole tree chips or uh, fuel wood chips are such low value that you really can't afford to do a logging job strictly to harvest biomass. Um, so if the, um, you know, if you kind of took two and two and made six here, um, and you said that the housing market booms, therefore saw log demand increases, um, that's actually probably going to make more biomass available rather than less available. Um, does uh, chip screening increase the cost of the product significantly? Um, there's certainly an investment there. Uh, and yes, it increases the cost, but I guess I haven't seen it increase the cost significantly at, at this point. I think uh, our suppliers that are doing bowl chips are... Um, are charging a little bit more, but they're they're still pretty competitive with with folks that aren't screening. Um, I guess I'd have to really look at the data um, that we collected over time to see what the um, uh, what different suppliers are actually charging to get a better handle on on what that cost difference might be. Um, Transportation cost really seems to be the, the major factor. And I can use an example, I guess, to, to illustrate that. One of our uh, chip suppliers who's screening is, uh, 
is in the same town, almost adjacent to one of the schools that they're supplying. And they consistently, even though they're producing a screen chip, they're consistently um, the lowest priced, that school is getting the lowest priced fuel of any schools in the state. Um, so really it's, you know, transportation costs seems to have a lot more effect on price than, than screening. It really kind of depends on how much money you have invested in that screening material. Um, I see we're at 12 o'clock or just after, and I'll uh, turn it back over to Dan and uh, see how he'd like to continue here. <laughs>